Hey, everybody. A uh, great one today, you know, for a change. The brilliant George Packer is with me, and he's written another great book. Uh, George is a National Book Award winner. Uh, he wrote one of my favorite books on the war in Iraq, uh, The Assassin's Gate. And uh, toward the beginning of COVID, he wrote a pretty scathing article about uh, for Atlantic uh, Monthly about how COVID had revealed the weaknesses uh, in our, our country. And now he's come out with um, a book, The Last Best Hope, America in Crisis, and, um, you know, he acknowledges what's uh, very obvious, that uh, 2020 was kind of the worst year in uh, this country since, well, I don't know, uh, Civil War. Um, I don't know. You got a lump in, there's World War II, there's a depression, but we lost more people than we had since World War II, 600,000 uh, Americans died in the Civil War, and that's how many have died from, from COVID. And this was just a complete failure by a United States uh, president. Um, the abdication of any accountability by this guy, uh, Trump. And um, uh, this is not a book about Trump, per se, but um, how we, actually more about how we got Trump, how, how we, as a country, uh, we're so ill-equipped uh, compared with the rest of the world. Remember, uh, we've led the world in deaths from the start of COVID uh, through the finish, fi finish line. I mean, we never relinquished the lead. And George draws a very vivid picture of what brought us uh, to this horrible uh, response uh, not just the horrible guy there, but uh, the insane divisions that we have in our country. Here's the thing. I'm old enough to remember polio. And I remember we got the polio vaccine. And everyone just went, okay, I'm going to take the polio vaccine. You know why? I don't want to get polio. My parents didn't want me to get polio. So I took the polio vaccine. And we didn't. Then we stopped getting polio. <sighs> okay. Now, there's still over 30% uh, of the country that just won't get vaccinated. And that's because uh, Trump saw it somehow in his interest to divide people. I think he thought if you divided people, especially after it was going so badly, which was kind of right at the right at the outset i think he thought that would uh he'd be able to get reelected if he did that and if if at the beginning he just acted responsibly you know not said it's all under control not said everybody can get a test if they want not not do what he did if if he hadn't divided us on wearing masks for god's sakes if he had handled this Responsibly, I think he, he probably would have been reelected, which, as we know, would have been its own existential disaster. And on top of that, then we had the, the murder of George Floyd and um, Trump's choice with that, more division. And then, of course, still insisting the election was stolen from him. Um, this is terrible. We're in the awful, awful spot. But Packer argues that all the conditions for these failures were in place and had been in place for uh, quite a number of years uh, from the startling wealth inequality and the uh, oppressive economic inequality in, in our, our country, the rage at elites, the meritocracy seen as a, a self-serving class of well-educated know-it-alls. Uh, I think I might be in that category to some extent, although I like to think I have some modesty. I think some people uh, who listen to the show... Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, sometimes I'm a little snarky about <clears throat> people don't know so much, but those are just Republicans. And speaking, Sarah Palin um, 
she, she uh, he he uh, talks about Sarah Palin and what he categorizes as real Americans, representing working class rural whites who resent everyone that they perceive to be above them in stature and and below by race and immigration status. And finally, uh, what he calls the just America, uh, those on the left, uh, the angry, self-righteous left, uh, which have instilled a lot of fear uh, into public dialogue. I think we recognize that. There's a lot of merit to a lot of what they're saying uh, that I agree with, but also just the chilling effect of people just thinking like, hmm, can I say it this way? Can I say it that way? That's not how you exchange ideas. That's not how we're supposed to do that. Uh, anyway, George's analysis is a pretty eye-opening analysis of how we got here. So I know you're going to uh, really love this one, uh, you know, for a change. But um, before I get, uh, get to George... Just want to remind you all that I'll be on a 15-city tour this fall. Uh, the only former U.S. senator currently on tour, tour. And you can check out the uh, itinerary of the tour, and you can buy your tickets now. The tickets are on sale. You can go to alfranken.com. I start in Northampton, Mass., and go all over the country, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, Dallas, Austin, Chicago, Kansas City, St. Louis, uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, Washington, D.C., ending at Town Hall in New York in triumph or disgrace. Anyway, go to alfranken.com and you can uh, check them out. Well, we got a great one today. George Packer. George Packer will be uh, right with us. And I, I swear to God, this one, finally, finally. Uh, you're gonna get you're gonna you're gonna get a lot out of this. You're gonna enjoy this. Let me summarize the book and then you tell me how off this is. Basically, you're looking at uh, America now, and we're screwed up. We're really screwed up, and uh, we're kind of in, uh, as you see it, like four Americas. And I'll let you describe those, and and you describe them how we got there, and then uh, you have some prescription at the end. You know, I think that's great. I think that's always ambitious, but I'm always skeptical about any prescription because uh, any prescription like that almost never happens. Would you agree with that? Have you read a lot of book like like and and it, it's sad when you read the prescription because the prescription is always right. <laughs> And it never happens. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Prescriptions are the worst part of any book. And mine are <laughs> hardly original. And and I cop to that. And I also cop to they there being long shots. Um, but I do think you kind of have to put something on the table. My main prescriptions are much broader. They're so general that they can't be uh, contradicted. And oh, that, they, that's and always they, safe. And they can't be, yeah, they can't be false. Also, you don't spend... That much time on it. The book begins with the year 2020 and what happened and why it happened. It's the worst year of my life for America. And what underlying causes led to one disaster after another. I mean, the word Trump is involved in all of them, but it's not all there is to Yeah, th it's thankfully... Trump is in perspective here, and, and believe me, you can't talk about this year without talking about Trump, but it isn't that much about Trump. It puts no. him in perspective. It, it, what led up to Trump and what, uh, what he says about where we are, for example, uh, if, if we go over this year, of course, you have your COVID, and he just screwed that up as badly as you possibly can, I think, and I yeah. don't think you disagree. And uh, Andy Slavitt has a book coming out, uh, Pandemic, uh, which goes through that. And one of the things he says in the book is that he took no accountability whatsoever for this thing. And I think that once he said that, you go, oh, yeah, yeah. I would, I would go further than that. I would say not only did he abandon the field, he was like a general who just abandoned the field and left his troops 
to fight a really powerful enemy alone without a commander, without a strategy, without a plan. Then he turned us against one another for his own benefit. He turned red against blue and blue against red by mocking mask wearing and talking about shooting people in the streets. And in every way he could, he used the pandemic not to try to end the pandemic, but as a way to divide the country in order to improve his reelection chances. Now, the, the great irony is that the pandemic is why he lost. It turns out there is some reality that Americans will not tolerate or be blind to. And the reality of the pandemic was just too big for Trump to lie about it and get away with it. I would argue, though, that given the reality of what he did and the reality of how what the carnage that ironically, the American carnage that it, it led to, that it was far too close, that he, he did successfully divide people and he did successfully. That goes without saying, yeah. of course. But don't you, don't you agree he would have won if there had not been a coronavirus? Well, not only that, he would have won if he'd handled it correct, right. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and the reason he didn't handle it right really was like his first decision was, I don't want the stock market to go down tomorrow. So I'm not going to say what this thing is, and then I'll leave, let it go another day, and then it crashed. And but the main thing Slava talks about is him saying, I, "It's all the states." And yeah. to me, it's as if after Pearl Harbor, FDR kind of just said, "You know what? This is uh, you know really kind of Hawaii's problem." Exactly, and that was Trump uh, with I think Jared Kushner whispering in his ear, realizing that this was beyond him. He did not have the confidence. <laughs> uh, it, it was probably even too boring for him. It, it, you know, it couldn't be turned into nonstop entertainment extravaganzas. So he abdicated, he, uh, he left the field and then told the sergeants and lieutenants, it's on you. You guys have to fight this fight. I'm out of here. And when he came back, he said, oh, by the way, sergeants and lieutenants, you really should be shooting each other not the enemy. Uh, why, why, why are you guys fighting uh, this enemy? You're, when you're really, talking about the governors, you mean, should be shooting each yeah, other, trying I mean, to get the... Red and blue governors, red and blue senators, red and blue Americans. That's how Trump saw everything by the end. How can I benefit from dividing the American people? But I, I got to add, the first part of my book goes on to say, why were we so easily divided? Why was it so possible to take what should have been a unifying thing, something that affected the entire country, like Pearl Harbor, like 9-11 in the first weeks afterward. And we've, it turned out we were just so easily turned on one another. And I think that goes to things that go beyond Trump and to underlying conditions like the bitter skepticism toward experts that a lot of Americans feel. And so when the CDC screws up, it's just dry tinder for a lot of Americans to say, the hell with it. I'm not going to wear a mask. They don't know what they're talking about, those experts. And, and, and the CDC's first screw up, of course, was bollocksing up the, the test. The test, yes. It also divided us not just along political lines, but class lines, racial lines, geographic lines. It showed all the fault lines that had been growing and widening over the last decade or two and exploited them. Uh -huh. And we became the world's leader in COVID deaths and infections and held that position for the entire year. And it showed, I think, a kind of a society that had lost its cohesion, that was no longer capable of collective self-government and solving a giant problem on the scale of a pandemic. So that's what the first part of the book is about. Right. And so let's go into what allowed this to happen in terms of not just Trump who obviously somebody else could have actually probably brought us together to fight this thing, but he exploited all these weaknesses. And uh, so go ahead, go ahead. Let's. Well, that's the second and kind of the heart of the book is a look at what I call the four Americas, which are the four, not groups of Americans, but ideas of America that have been dominant during your and my adult life. Okay, let's go through them. Let's go through them. We begin with free America, 
That's Reagan's America. That's the most powerful of the four. It really set the terms of political debate for decades. Right, shining city on a hill. The shining city on the hill with low taxes and 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 no regulations and setting business free and, and getting government out of your way so that you can pursue your own uh, dreams. The nine most terrifying words in the English language is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And that is one of his famous lines. And and I'd like to replace that with, I'm Jared Kushner, and I'm here to help. I'm here to help, yeah, except he wouldn't say I'm here to help. <laughs> I'm here to benefit. I'm Jared Kushner, and I'm here to profit. So free America was attractive to a lot of people because the 70s was such a shitty decade. There was trouble in the cities. There was gas lines. There was stagflation, if that word means anything to anyone under 60. It, it, it is what it says. The economy stagnated and we had terrible inflation, stagflation. And exactly. stagflation, exactly. young people. High unemployment, high inflation, high interest rates. And government seemed able to do nothing right. And corruption, Watergate, the lies of the Vietnam War, all of it kind of led to yeah, let's just have a Hollywood myth maker tell us that we could be great and beautiful and the shining city on the hill if only government would just get out of the way. And that was free America in a kind of cartoon version, which Reagan portrayed. And it was powerful and became orthodoxy for Rep the Republican Party and remains orthodoxy for the elites of the Republican Party. Even today, all you hear is the answer to every problem is cut taxes cut regulations, shrink government. That's, that's the Republican Party in, in, uh, in Congress now, basically. Exactly. But it's not Republican voters so much anymore. And that's the, re the story goes on. The second of my four Americas, of these four narratives, is smart America, which I think of as the America of the 90s. It dominated during the Clinton years. It came to dominate the Democratic Party. This is the narrative of the educated class of professionals, of meritocrats, people who believe who have gained wealth and success, not by hoarding capital or resources, but through brain power and who occupy the the most coveted professions, law, medicine, journalism, uh, academia, et cetera, and who really became kind of the base of the Democratic Party along with non-white working class Americans. But the narrative was dominated by the educated. Right, and, and admired widely by all Americans. Loved, I would say. Uh, Loved this, this, in many there's ways. A kind of, <laughs> there's a quality to this narrative that I think makes people quite resentful. Mm -hmm. And that quality is this. It says you need to do what I've done. Go to college, go to the right college, go into the right profession, and your talents will take you as far as they can, and our society will reward you. If you don't make it, it's your own fault. That's the, where the meritocracy is quite cruel. And may I add, uh, yes. which you point out a lot in the book, is that the meritocracy is self-serving and yes. closed, or, and perceived to be closed, and in reality is quite closed because uh, it's really much harder to get into one of these schools that uh, gives you the degree that uh, is entree into the meritocracy if your parents aren't part of the meritocracy already. Exactly. It's for a poor person to get into a top Ivy League university, which of course isn't the only way to, uh, to make it, but it's the way that meritocrats recognize as the way to make it. For a poor person to get in is just as hard now as it was in 1954. We've made no progress in opening our most elite universities to poor Americans. So it isn't really in a certain kind of way a meritocracy at all. I call it a new aristocracy into which people are born. Your ticket is punched at birth. Your parents will ensure that you go to the right schools, that you work hard in those schools, that you do well on standardized tests that you go to the right university and meet the right people, you have a work ethic, you read the right books, you hear the right words around the house. Maybe they put Beethoven on the headphones when you're a toddler. 
And by the time you're in your 20s, your way is clear. You're going to be part of the meritocracy. I'll give you, can I give you an example of this that per, hit me personally? So um, I'm uh, with my grandson, who at the time was seven. This was a year ago. He's looking at a Dr. Seuss book on the body, and he's looking at a chart of the organs. And he says to me, Grandpa, I would have to assume that there's some kind of tube leading from the kidneys to the bladder. And then I went, oh, man, his, both his parents went to grad school. <laughs> this is so unfair. Now, that's uh, yeah. my, that was my, literally my reaction. It wasn't like, what an adorable kid. <laughs> but, if you, okay. but, Al, but a lot of parents hear that and they think, yes, we're on our way. He, <laughs> well, I thought that too. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, thank you for being honest. If you stop yeah. being honest, then we're, lo we're all lost. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it's a hollow promise of a meritocracy. Of course, merit still matters. And there are people who can rise out of poverty sure. uh, to success, but it's really hard. And there's a kind of complacency and hypocrisy about it. And I think meritocrats know this, but because it indicts them and because it undermines the claims of this system, they go to a lot of trouble not to know it. And that's the, the kind of characteristic blindness or hypocrisy that drives people crazy and leads to our third of the four Americans. Let me add one last thing about that. Yeah. Meritocrats also uh, are capable of understanding they're deluding themselves. So there's, they feel guilty. Go ahead. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're going to feel a lot guiltier when we get to the fourth now. Okay, go. So okay. <laughs> go. The, third, the third narrative I call real America. You may remember, Al, in 2008, Sarah Palin used that phrase to a fundraiser in North Carolina. And she said, I'm so happy to be here in the real America. Right where patriotic, hardworking Americans raise our food and fight our wars. And it was a very clear and divisive line between the elites, the coastal liberals, the city people, the blacks, the browns, the immigrants who are not real Americans, right. and the real America. What is real America? It's white Christians in the heartland who... Uh, may not have the advanced educations of the meritocrats, but who have always thought of themselves as kind of the, the backbone of the country and who resent the elites, those above them, and some people below them, as they perceive it, who are in some ways replacing them as the, the stars of the story of America. It's a, so it's a, a pretty bitter and resentful uh, narrative that feels like we're being left behind and uh, the wrong people are in charge. So and they're that, the Tea Party. That's the Tea Party. And really, it's Trump. I think of Palin as mm -hmm. John, the, John the Baptist to Trump. And Palin should not be underestimated as an early warning sign of this narrative. But Trump exploited it masterfully, uh, exploited its resentments, and wrote it to the White House Real America is a rebellion against free as well as smart America because Trump did not run for president on low taxes, deregulation, and give giveaways to corporations. In fact, he denounced some of that because he knew that by 2015 or 2016, the mass of Republicans, the, the base of the party, were not in sync with uh, the Ayn Rand loving Wall Street Journal reading, uh, entrepreneur worshiping elites of the party who wanted, who still believed in that Reagan orthodoxy, which had become utterly empty and had failed to solve problems and in fact had created problems. Real America is a rebellion against that. And, and yet that Reagan, that's, that strain of Republicans is still who gets served yeah. by those in the Senate and, and that. Yes. Once Trump took power, who benefited? Corporations, the rich, his one legislative achievement, the tax law, uh, was a huge boon to those groups, not to the people who elected Trump. But he kept them in a state of perpetual boiling with his rhetoric, with his culture warfare, which is 
the so it's way kind of a classic he, demagogue. In yeah, other words, he's yeah, serving he's serving Republican elites while uh, keeping people who are distracted, <laughs> uh, who aren't them, by feeding them bullshit. And a demagogue is a characteristic figure of our way of life. It's a democrat. It's a symptom of democracy because. Demagogues play on the feeling of ordinary people that they should be in charge and not the experts who are a special class, a privileged class. So Trump got all of that and played on the resentment. And, and Hillary represented, of course, the uh, those smart, people. smart America. Yes, yeah. the experts, the you know the epidemiologists, the uh, trade negotiators, the journalists the professors, all the people who Trump loved to mock and to denounce, as well as he mocked and denounced black Americans, brown Americans, shithole countries, et cetera. So he had it kind of pointing both ways, which is the the position that real America is in. It feels resentment both above it and below it. And Trump, in his reptilian genius, understood that. Yeah. And uh and nearly destroyed our democracy by by fe feeding it. Came close and is still trying. Republican elites are stuck with it because they have abdicated to it. They've kowtowed to it. So the Republican base, which is that narrative, is going to be with the Republican Party and therefore with the whole country for a long yeah for a long time. Trump Trump released it from its confinement. And and they are, believe me, they're just. They're they're going along with it. That's why we saw the vote we saw yesterday against the voting rights legislation. Yes. Well, that I think that's just pure power politics. That's Mitch McConnell knowing that that bill was a a threat to minority rule. Okay, and I see it. The Republic, and the Republicans have been consolidating minority rule for many years now. Okay, so sum up the uh, the, go through the first three and then we'll get to number four. Yeah, so free, free America is libertarian. It's it's get government off my back. Smart America is is meritocratic. It's uh it, if you get the right education and 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 go to the right schools, you will be among the winners in globalized cosmopolitan diverse America. It welcomes diversity. It welcomes uh, globalization as a the kind of a, a pleasure ground for the winners in the knowledge economy, uh, which is where smart America has succeeded. Real America are those who feel left behind, white Americans who feel left behind, who feel uh, that they have been shafted both by uh, the economy which is no longer an economy where a high school degree will support a family and shafted by the culture, which seems to be being taken over by people who don't look like them, who don't sound like them, who some, some, in some cases use language that is alienating and, uh, and who despise them, frankly, who show contempt for them. The fourth narrative is also a rebellion from below but it's on the left. I call it just America. It's the social justice millennial America that I think kind of came out of the universities, out of ca college campuses and into the wider culture in the year 2014. A lot of things happened that year and after that year, of course, culminating last summer in the George Floyd protests. This is a rebellion against smart America, against the promises of meritocracy, which this generation finds hollow. They grew up with the financial crisis and the Great Recession and with the intense competitiveness that the meritocracy imposes on them. And, and it's, instead of saying, we'll be part of the family business of success, they rebelled against their parents, smart America, and said, no, this is a lie. The meritocracy doesn't work. In fact, America doesn't work. It's a caste system. It's always been a caste system. Uh, it's hollowed out by, by systemic racism from the beginning, and really not much has changed. There hasn't been as much progress as we've been told. The Obama language of uh, becoming a more perfect union leaves 
this narrative cold. And instead, it's a kind of scathing and, and, and top to bottom critique of what their parents have assured them is is true. And, and there's a tremendous amount of truth to all of that. And uh, one thing I just, as soon as you say Obama administration, I and I note, you note this in your book, not one of these bank executives went to prison. Yeah, that made a lot of people both in real America and just America cynical. It's rigged. The system is rigged. This is what I wrote about in The Unwinding about eight years ago, that so many people in out of the way, in forgotten places, felt like the, the deal was struck between the elites in business, in politics, in the media. We were somehow making off with it and they were, it had nothing to do with them. In fact, it was screwing them. So hard to be of that generation, younger than we are, and not think that the game is is somehow rigged. So yeah, there is a lot of truth to it, but I also have a sinking feeling that it has led us to a dead end. It is not a narrative that's going to get us out of this divisiveness, this polarization, this constant warfare in which each of these narratives sees the others as a threat to all that they hold dear, all that America stands for. That's sort of where we are but today. if you ask if you ask just america people in just america if you say that to them they go yeah why why <laughs> why should we give in to uh we can't give in the real america we can't give in the smart america we can't give in the reagan's america what are you suggesting well what do you want to achieve you know do you want to begin to reduce racism in this country? Do you want to yep. slow down global warming? Do yep. you want to reverse economic inequality? Yep. Do you want to save democracy? Yep. You think you can do it simply by berating and protesting? They don't know anything else to do. Well, <laughs> we have, that's, that's what we that do. That's true. <laughs> and that's why, and that gets to some of my sort of solutions. We have to rebuild things in this country in order to have the ability to achieve the, the justice that we want. We can't protest alone um, and certainly Twitter alone, which is what a lot of journalists spend ungodly amounts of time on, is is not going to do it and I think is actually destructive. Oh, social media has to play a big role in all of this. It does. Just it, in terms it, it of especially in uh you know real america and also in the incredible amount of disinformation that is being spread by the right it is so pernicious i wanted to ask you about this but maybe not at this point in the interview but i do want to ask you about like a tucker carlson type person um he knows better and he is just spreading disinformation that probably kills people. And I know he gets, you know, it's money and it's a big audience and uh, status and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering what it is, but I guess it's cynicism. I guess it's just cynicism. He just, you know, this is not in his moral framework, not in his moral universe that I'm, oh, no, nope, I, uh, I have no qualms about this whatsoever. I'll just spread this disinformation and it'll work it'll work well for me. But man, oh man, oh man, it's 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 destructive, isn't it? Have you ever seen that movie A Face in the Crowd? I have, but at but at the end they get their comeuppance, the guy gets his comeuppance. And, and Joe McCarthy got his comeuppance, and George Wallace got his comeuppance, and Father Coughlin got his comeuppance. I think these these demagogues, both in politics and in media, they always crash. You might say Rush Limbaugh died before he could crash, but I think in history he will crash because the sheer destructiveness and the, the opportunism is it becomes so apparent to succeeding generations that Joe McCarthy was hugely popular in 1953. Today, he's almost universally reviled. I think the same will be true of Tucker Carlson and of Rush Limbaugh. That's interesting. You know, he's such an inside player. We'll see. We'll see. But, you know, I wrote Rush Limbaugh as a big fat idiot and other observations. Mm -hmm. I wrote lies and lying liars who tell them about 
uh, O'Reilly and Hannity and and Coulter, all of whom you name, especially uh, Hannity and <laughs> Coulter. Now it's it's like the the descent of the right from New, from William F. Buckley to Sean Hannity, from Ronald Reagan to Ted Cruz. Um, you may disagree with Reagan and Buckley, but you have to give them a certain respect for being good at what they do. And where does Gingrich fit in there? Because I'm Gingrich is the key to all of it. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gingrich is the most important politician of the last 50 years. Mm. Forget Obama, Reagan, Clinton. It's it's Gingrich. Why? Because he saw how to turn politics into as Warfare. he loved to quote Chairman Mao, war without blood. He saw all the tactics for turning the opponent into the enemy who had to be destroyed by any means for how to keep the public in a constant state of rage. Um, Learn to and, talk like Newt. Remember that? Yep. Those tapes that he, he would make and all the Republican candidates would drive around their district with the tape in their... Yeah, it'd be treason. Back yeah. We had cassette players in our cars and he was a master at it. Yeah, call, was, call your opponent corrupt corrupt or traitor decay and he there was nothing conservative about newt gingrich he was a radical he was an institution breaker he came to congress in 1978 explicitly to break the hold of the democratic party on the house and in doing so to, to break the norms and institutions of the house itself and uh he he got there for a little while and then of course like all radicals and revolutionaries. He was consumed by the fire that he had lit and got driven out uh, by his own Jacobins uh, in the late 90s. So, you know, he also violated the law and that kind of thing. But um, I think he would have gotten away with that if he hadn't uh, set those fires. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it's like, you know, there's always a guillotine waiting for the guy who starts the revolution. And my guess is it, it will get Trump at some point. Well, I, you know, you think? I mean, how many? <laughs> uh, I, I believe the uh, new Manhattan DA may be involved with uh, Donald Trump. No, it may just take the form of a Republican convention that figures out a way to keep him from getting renominated or something. But yeah, anyway. Well, yeah, we'll talk about the future, but on the way there, on the way there, he, he, uh, I have the feeling that he may be in legal, a uh, lot of legal and financial trouble, uh, in that, that long a period. But I get, a, I get the feeling out that I have more reservations about just America than you do. Um, no, I, I do. I, Believe me, I do. And I do. It, part of it is just the anger and the, um, the the uh, how doctrinaire it seems to be yes and it's how illiberal. it's it's you, illiberal you write about this you write about how it's impossible to really have a um a productive conversation when you have to think about every word you're going to say and worry is that if if people are censoring themselves before words come out of their mouth that's no way to exchange ideas. And we've now gotten there in the yes. society and in large part because of just America. And it's, it's not simply that people want to purify our language in order to bring virtue and justice. I think it's a form of power. It's, it's a way that people who don't necessarily have much political or economic power, but have cultural power, have figured out that they can intimidate and, oh, that's it. Yep. And force the the people who care about what they think to kneel and to accept uh, a degree of unfreedom and of self censorship that is incompatible with a liberal society and with an unfettered mind. I mean, the, if yes. you're going to be people are going to be free to to think and to think out loud and to debate and discuss and. They can't be going like, hmm, how do I put this? How can I say this? Oh, I better not say it this way. Oh, I better not say this. Especially because overnight, while you were sleeping, a whole bunch of new 
forbidden terms might have entered the the ledger and and you didn't even know about them i thought i could use that word now no that word is actually now uh considered to be racist or sexist or somethingist and this constant shifting of of the terms and of the of the standards is one form of power so here's where there's a parallel with real america real america uses disinformation, as you said. I mean, lies, a really massive propaganda campaign to spread lies into the body politic until we don't know what is true and what is not. Just America uses information in a different way, not on a kind of large scale systematic lying campaign, but by creating fear about speech in such a way that certain things can't be said and therefore can't be thought. For example, just recently, the podcast of the Journal of the American Medical Association had a guy on, a doctor who's connected to JAMA and who, this is, you know, this is smart America. These guys are the experts. And he said, perhaps too casually, socioeconomic factors are really more important than structural racism in producing disadvantages in society. This is now a forbidden thought. And he not only did he lose his job at JAMA, the editor of JAMA, who had nothing to do with the podcast, also lost his job. And this became a kind of warning. If you venture into this area and start thinking these thoughts and saying these things, you might suffer a big, very serious penalty. Whereas just a few years ago, these were ideas that we could argue out. They were real questions and needed data and needed counter arguments in order to sort out what's true and what isn't. And now we're in this airtight compartment where facts cannot penetrate, ideas cannot penetrate, and the dogma makes everyone um, either feel powerful and in lockstep or afraid. And that's why Just America doesn't, I don't think is capable of solving the problems it wants to solve. You, in order to solve problems, you need to be able to allow various points of view and above all facts, even unpleasant facts, into the conversation. Are there people in Just America, there are people in the, you would put in that category, who are open to real discussion and who do like to <laughs> uh, debate openly and and are, I mean, can you be in both? Can you be in just America and also mm. observe the kind of rules of discourse that are productive? Well, I, or of by course, definition, are, is can, that not? Of course you can try. And there are many people who want to try, but I know a lot of these people personally, they're afraid. They're watching themselves. Journalists are watching themselves. That, that's what I want to ask you because, you know, I, I see people who I admire who are saying the things that just America is saying, but they're saying it in truthful ways, but that are, op that, that are actually honest and open intellectually. And I'm sure they're careful too. I'm sure they're careful too. Um, but, it, you're seeing this in the circles that you're in, the intellectual circles that you're in. I, I see it a lot in media and in academia. That's where I think it's strongest, but it's also in philanthropy. It's in the arts. For example, Lin-Manuel Miranda, who is a genius and I thought was sort of above criticism, has been rabidly criticized for casting the wrong color people in the movie of his musical in the heights um and rather than saying as an artist i have to have a certain amount of freedom uh to represent my characters as i think i should instead he apologized because he knew he was in danger he felt threatened so even lin manuel miranda is uh, there's a guillotine waiting for him too if he's not careful? No, yeah, that's kind of that's really chilling, is what it is, right? That's the word. It's chilling. So, I would love for Just America to become the liberal, free, <laughs> open, tolerant, and therefore all the more strong and just movement that it we need.
but it's headed in the wrong direction into this dead end that I'm describing. I have a an alternative to all of this, Al, which may draw on some of the best of each of these, if you can speak of that. It's what I call... Equal. I'm not interested in this part. You don't want to hear about no, it? No, no, no. Actually, wait a minute. No, I think you should be able to talk about it, yeah. Uh, if not, then we're just leaving your listeners with pure <laughs> negativity and criticism. And I, I, I wrote a book called Last Best Hope because I didn't want... Okay, to, okay. To go evade, go evade talk evade. about your solution. I'm not going to talk about my little piddly prescriptions, but I will talk about the ideas behind them. Okay, good. And that's two things. That's modest. Two things, equality and self-government. They're deeply related in America. Alexis de Tocqueville said the most striking thing about Americans to a European is their passion for equality, their desire to be as good as everyone else, to be able to do what they want, to have equal opportunity with everyone, to have no part of our society closed off, no special privileges for anyone. That has never been a reality here, obviously, certainly not in Tocqueville's time, but it's always been a desire. And you can't discount it. You can't try to smother it because it will always be burning. And when it's not satisfied, we have endless social conflict. And I think a good deal of the conflict we have today results from a, a country that has grown more and more unequal and has not satisfied people's passion for equality. Let's talk about how you achieve that. Let's talk about, for example, you talk about uh, equality in education. It's so clear to anybody that in this country that your K through 12 experience has a lot to do with the tax base of the community that you live in, which is like, really, guys, that's uh, that's how we're going to do things. It's a, it's, a national <laughs> disgrace. it's a national disgrace that we just live with and don't even notice in some ways uh, because we're so used to it. But it's it's absolutely unjust and i mean i would ways. can i interrupt you on this just to yeah, yeah. tell you what my experience okay as senator i would go to a school district a school a high school in a very you know in an affluent not in like an extremely affluent suburb but in an affluent suburb of minneapolis and holy crap i would get like okay we're gonna have 24 students uh to give you the tour they're breaking into <laughs> groups of threes, and one will show you the new music department with every instrument you could possibly imagine. Then we're gonna the, these are gonna show you the labs. These are gonna show you the unbelievable athletic facilities. Then you go to a high school in inner city Minneapolis, and you go like, "Holy crap! This looks like it hasn't been touched since 1958." Yep. And you go like, wait a minute, everybody, come on. And every, <laughs> and every child that goes into that school knows yeah. just instinctively, I do not count as much. I'm not equal. I'm second class. It's just a message that we send to our children every day they go to school. You are first class. You are second class. You are third class. And that's enough to make you just. It makes <laughs> you crazy. It, it breaks every solemn promise that america makes uh to its people so I, george i, I want to be respectful of your time and you have 10 minutes you told me so so you go so yeah well we're talking about the keys which are why equality is for me the north star of of our country and of the uh, of american sense of themselves if they don't feel that they are on the same level in some way not that we all have the same income that we all have the same goods, but that we're all worth the same. If we don't feel that way, we don't have a sense of citizenship together. And without that, we don't govern ourselves well. And that's the other half of this. We have lost the art of self-government, another phrase from Tocqueville. We lost, we've lost. we lost the skills, the talents, the, the, the ability to sit down together and solve problems. And Education has something to do with that. Journalism and the critique I gave you of journalism has something to do with that. 
So does like the lack of um, maybe of national service, which I think would be a powerful way for Americans from different backgrounds to have to get to know one another, at least for a year and work together. The lack of civics in our schools, which teaches Mm -hmm. children how to think (laughs) and how to debate and how to understand what it means to be a citizen in a democracy. So equality and self-government are interconnected here. In America, without equality, there can be no self-government. And without self-government, we can't get closer to equality. So, you know, I have a bunch of small ideas at the end of the book, but those are the fundamental ways through this. And I call it equal America. It's my fifth narrative. And the one that I think has the most potential to embrace many, if not all of us. And 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 some of the prescriptions you're talking about are, for example, um, labor unions. Yes. You know, power and workers. And, and, and it, you know, the minimum wage and, and, and just what people get paid for God's sakes. Yeah. It's just as much of a disgrace as what we were talking about with the schools. It's just pathetic. And it tells, you know, the Walmart associate, uh, the Home Depot associate, as they call them in order to hide the fact that they're being paid shit. It tells them that you don't count. You are disposable. You write about the feelings of of condescension, resentment, and shame. And that really struck me. Yeah, that, well, that's how people in my class, I think, often feel toward workers, toward the people who are in the warehouses boxing the goods that are going to come on the Amazon truck or people who work in the food processing plants and are producing the hamburger that they're going to grill on the 4th of July. We had to notice them last year. They became the essential workers. We suddenly had to think about where all that came from. And that was a healthy moment. I would like for us to go on noticing them and even to thinking about how to give them more power economically more of a voice politically and just more of an equal status in our society. And certainly bargaining power is a key to it. And I think another part of that is breaking down the power of these big monopolies that dominate industries Boy, and keep yeah. workers down and create all this inequality between regions um, that we've seen over the last half century. And that too is was something free America gave us. And we should... Uh, we should find ways through antitrust legislation and through empowering of workers to to reverse the imbalance. It's a, I, I it's, think there has been a shift yeah. in antitrust thinking. Uh, you very rightly pick up the Reagan, the Bork uh, change uh, approach to antitrust. But when I think of condescension, re- resentment, and shame, I also think just of working class people who feel the condescension and who feel resentment and also feel shame. And man, oh man. Yeah, because that sense of impotence that you can't control your fate. You are at the mercy of these giant forces, corporations, politicians, big media companies that essentially tell you who you are and what you can and can't have and do. And it all adds up to just a struggle for survival so that actually being able to be a citizen and participate in self-government is a luxury. You cannot have civic virtue in a class that is immiserated, that's struggling just to survive from day to day. And it's another disgrace that we have people who work all the time and are struggling to survive. And so this is where I put a lot of the emphasis on for equality, economic equality, which you know is never exact. We don't have equal outcomes in this country. We can't have them, nor should we try. But we should try to create something closer to equal status and equal opportunity, which is what Americans have always wanted. It's that passion that drives us. And I think if we get closer to that, the temperature of our politics the vitriol, the hatred will go down. It won't go out, but it will go down. People will be less easily riled up into um, joining a Facebook group that says that this other group should not exist. George, thank you. This is a terrific book. I I really enjoyed it, as always, Alan, and all the best to you. Hope we do it again. 
Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.